Our next speaker is Dr. Reynold Panateri, Jr. He is the Robert Mayock and David Cooper Endowed Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Director of the Airways Biological Initiative, Director of the Comprehensive Asthma Program of the Penn Health System, and Deputy Director of the Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. He will be speaking on the future of health research. Please welcome Dr. Panateri. Well, I too uh, would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and what I get asked as the Deputy Director and Translational Biologist of our center is, will hydraulic fracturing make me sick? And that's a really tough question to answer, and I'm gonna show you why. We have preliminary data, uh, and like the previous speaker, uh, this is work that is in progress. It's in draft form for publication, uh, but we all recognize that early work, um, not peer-reviewed, needs to be taken uh, with some, some, uh, some priority. So again, uh, our center there in the website, uh, www.med.upenn.edu slash seat, is a Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology. We're the only one in the EPA-5 district that includes Maryland, um, um, Pennsylvania, as well as other states in this area. So uh, there's a, a province there to be able to understand the health consequences of hydrofracturing. Now, what I practice is functional redundancy when I lecture. That means if you don't hear it five times today, it's probably not important. So you're gonna hear speakers that there's some functional redundancy. We cover things multiple times. Those are the things that really matter. So what is Marcella Shale? And I'm just borrowing on some of uh, the work that's been already uh, presented. Half of the land mass of Pennsylvania, 22,000 square miles, 84 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Enough, enough fuel to entire the U.S. population for, a year, uh, for four years, as you can see. And the area is incredible in how it's affecting Pennsylvania. Now, where and when might we expect healthcare consequences. So what I'm gonna do is take you through the operation and highlight points of interest and points of interaction with known toxicants. And that is an opportunity for further research. So at the drill head, and we heard just beautifully moments ago about the gasket, but what we're talking about is a five to 10 acre plot, ideally one, um, uh, one per square mile, but we know that there's gonna be many drill heads. The highest density is in Susquehanna County. Some of our preliminary data be focused on that northeast component, looking at Bradford, Susquehanna, and Wayne County, and looking at the health consequences by reported healthcare utilization. What has been described is a need for about 22,000 to 160,000 drill rigs, and as of uh, the most recent data were about 13,000 permits, which uh, is shown here, but we'll have a more granular map of that shortly. And here is the Harvard World Maps, unfortunately doesn't uh, show up well, but here is the, actually the New York border, and you can see nary a well on the other side, but each of these is a permit that has been allocated for drilling, the density is unbelievable. The process we've already heard, so you go down miles and then you make a left and a right hand turn and with that turn you deliver high pressured propellant as well as other items including silica and as a pulmonary doctor, silica is a major cause of silicosis an untreatable interstitial lung disease but there's many other items in the backflow or flow back that has health consequences. Most notably, in the subsequent speakers, when we talk about the consequences in health, it is not just 
the water contamination by far. It is also the air pollution associated with the trucks that will truck in and out all of the components necessary for hydrofracturing. In addition, there's noise, and I'm thrilled to hear that someone will be talking about stress and stress response. So incredibly important. The reason you're here right now is because you're experiencing a stress response to the consequences of hydrofracturing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So, there's already consequences potentially on health. Now, we want to be completely balanced. Our goal is not to say yay or nay. We want the data. And with the data comes knowledge, and with knowledge, hopefully an understanding of the health consequences. So where is the first pro problem? Well, with the drilling itself, workers are going to be exposed. But you have enormous quantities of flowback fluid. We had heard about that. You need about 5 million gallon, gallons of water per well, well head. Well, we heard that you may have 5 to 8 per site or pad site, so multiply that. That's 40 million gallons. Each truck will carry 4,000 gallons of water. That is about 1,250 truckloads. Propont, uh, which is an incredible compound of silicon sand, needs to be trucked in and out. And again, you can see what the mixture looks like with the flowback that's filling these pond areas that are covered with plastic. We already heard about the need for the, uh, to park the trucks. Here is a, uh, just a picture, and you've seen this, of a diesel trucking area. But most notably for me as a pulmonologist is the consequences of idling trucks 20 and 30 deep on beautiful bucolic roads that are not exposed, not exposed to ozone particulate matter 2.5 and 10. So these idling trucks are not necessarily directly contaminating water, which has been a focus in the previous talks, but also the air. This is sort of the air that we breathe in Philadelphia. But let me tell you that the air monitors in Philadelphia, which number about 200 to 250, in the areas of Susquehanna, Bradford, uh, county in Wayne, there's six. Six, meaning that there's no tracking of the air pollution quantity or consequences in this case. So nighttime flaring. Nighttime flaring is associated with demonstration that the well is viable. Here is an, just a, a photo of a flaring event. Um, actually, I was sitting in front of someone who was telling me that uh, they experienced a flaring event that lasted six months. I mean, six weeks, pardon me. That flaring is inducing a variety of compounds into the air that are then inspired by not only mammals, including humans, but all the other animals in that area. We also recognize that wet gas is really what occurs most notably here in southwestern Pennsylvania. But in northeastern, the dry gas has other components, other fracturing fluids that are completely proprietary. The processing and transportation requires dehydration and condensation to remove the water and volatile organic compounds, VOCs. The liquefied hydrocarbon byproducts, propane and uh, butane, are then moved to compressor sites. High pressure gas lines, as shown here, travel across the PA countryside. And curiously, workers who are working on the welding aspect, again, welding can cause a variety of lung uh, dysfunctions, is exempt from safety regulations because of the nature of the country, that, uh, the, the, uh, the current guidelines. Pipes then join the national grid. So the potential for air pollution is substantial. We know VOCs and nitrogen oxides generate ground level ozone. Ozone exacerbates asthma and COPD. It's actually one of the most common causes in LA and other metropolitan centers in the hot summer's day. The ground, uh, the diesel exhaust, 
uh, actually generates a variety of compounds, many of these that are level one carcinogens, VOC, betadiene, acrenaline, and a variety of others. Now, the fluids that are used in hydrofracturing, unfortunately, are completely proprietary. Now, there are some disclosures, and I tip my hat to those companies that do it, but it is really completely proprietary, and we don't have access, potentially, to the flow back constituents in your area if you're exposed, and if that vendor doesn't tend to report it. We can see there's a whole variety, a variety of, of, of molecules that are used. Here is the potential water pollution uh, consequences. Many of these items are carcinogenic. So we need to know what is in the fluid, very important, if we are to predict risk. If you can't predict risk if you don't know what the compounds are. That's a very simple toxicology kind of concept. Not only do you need to know the, all the compounds, but you need the relative concentrations because there's interactions between toxicants that are not necessarily predicted by one toxicant alone. That is one plus one equals three, not one plus one equals two. So we really need this information. Now, the possible health effects of the chemicals and looking at just a cancer registry, here are the solubles and volatiles that have been identified in some flow back in hydrofracturing fluid. And you can see virtually every organ, every organ is clearly affected. Now, the flow back fluid and is, is, does contain arsenic, barium, a variety of other compounds. The maximum excess here or the maximum contaminant levels are in parts per million. This is the fold changes on this side that have been recognized. So as you can see, we're talking about not one, two, or three fold. In some instances, you're talking about 3,000 fold. So again, understanding the constituents is a challenge. The potential for water pollution flow back fluid is shown here. Not only is it the contaminants I mentioned, VOCs, but also radioactive components. Radium is shown here. And you can see that some have been in excess of 10,000 fold increases. Now, where we've gone is through the drilling with the trucks that are pulling things in and out. But what do you do with all that water? We heard moments ago, it goes to Ohio, but not all the time. This particular map shows Pennsylvania with approved wastewater disposal sites. So the environmental exposure to individuals around these wastewater sites is gonna be substantially different from the wells that are being drilled. So we need to be vigilant with regard to the different healthcare consequences of living near a wastewater disposal site. And you can see there's actually a cluster here in southwestern Pennsylvania. There's occupational exposure. And I'm thrilled to see that you're gonna have a whole 45 minute talk on, on occupational exposure consequences, so I won't belabor that but it was mentioned in the previous talk. Here you're looking at drillers. Many of these uh, came, are transients that came from Texas, unfamiliar with the area. Uh, here is just an example of an active drilling site, and that is not a poor rendition photograph, uh, photograph. You're looking at a cloud of silica, a cloud of sand and the typical eight hour exposure. So these are tremendous exposures to sand and silica that can induce lung disease, most notably in high concentrations for the workers. Other exposures, we already mentioned uh, the fracking uh, chemical exposure. Here is a leaky well, and I did not have a movie. I'm just not from Cornell, I'm from Pennsylvania. So I've, <laughs> 
So we, we can't afford that really slick stuff that was shown at Cornell. So this is a static picture, but if you just, if you've been to Niagara Falls, this is sort of the Niagara Falls of, of a, frac a fracturing site where you're having a substantial leakage. Now, what does science tell us about air quality? I built a story that it goes well beyond the concerns of your water. It's also in the air. Well, we know the natural gas drilling in the Barnett Shale since 2002, and we can borrow. We can borrow some of that evidence. It's very close to Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area, and I'll tell you how close. You could have a house within 100 yards of a fracking site, which is incredible in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They monitored air quality, nitrogen oxide, uh, volatile organic compounds like benzene and ozone. They had flyby helicopters and a variety of cameras that were si uh, sampling. They sampled 560 sites. And the level of concern for benzene acutely with drilling was 180 parts per billion, 1.4 parts per billion, a substantial increase over the lowest minimum concern. These were demonstrated, actually, all the levels demonstrated by state-of-the-art uh, state gas chromatography. Bottom line here is there's concern. So what does science tell us about water quality? Well, there were seven residential wells in uh, Leroy Township, Bradford County that affected by the Chesapeake natural gas drilling. They found that the one well two had 30 micrograms per, uh, per liter of arsenic. It's about a hundred fold increase. Two to seven had elevated sodium, but not barium, calcium, manganese, or potassium. The re uh, remediation was to give the residents bottled water. Case two, 11 homes in Damak. You'd already heard about that debacle. They found a substantial number of contaminated wells, and we're all very familiar with the particulate seen in water as well as the flammable water from your faucets. Well, you saw this slide also. Again, functional redundancy. If you see this slide, multiple, uh, multiple speakers feel this is valued, and you're looking at the distance to the nearest well and methane concentrations. Bottom line, the closer you are, the closer you are to get exposed to methane. Much higher levels. The further you're away, the levels dramatically go down. And this was a, uh, a really remarkable paper by PNAS 2011. I was struck by the publications in this area. I do a lot of work in asthma, and we cite papers back to 1990. But what you're seeing today are publications from 2011, 2012, 2013. That means there's no history. The history is now. So we're in a very unique uh, opportunity to further investigate in a controlled manner what is the health consequences, because there is no memory. And it's very different well drilling today, you heard in the previous speaker, in comparison to well drilling 10 years ago. So we really need baseline data, and we need to track the consequences. So what are the state of affairs in Pennsylvania? We've been very active in Harrisburg, trying to implore our legislation to at least fund research so that we can understand the health consequences. Well, let's go through the timeline. Governor Corbett was elected in 2011, refuses to evoke an impact fee on gas drillers. And of course, what's the consequence to that? No fee, no harm, we're gonna drill. The Secretary Cranser places a moratorium on wastewater treatment using the EPA Region 3 interve uh, intervention in May 2011. The Delaware Water uh, uh, based, uh, the Delaware Basin Water Commission postpones a decision on hydrofracking indefinitely, which is very important. Act 13 now imposes an impact fee induced. The state takes back back zoning authority from townships and municipalities, imposes CDA for healthcare professionals 
to treat patients. That particular gag order, I think, was incredibly damaging, where healthcare providers were not allowed to report potential exposure or consequences of exposure. The state has primacy over water safety, and the Halberton exemption makes flow water back exempt from all acts. Tom Corbett then states, I will direct the Department of Environmental uh, 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 Protection to return to its core mission of protecting the environment based on sound science. Now, the EPA is in place to find violations. The EPA is not doing health consequences. So don't confuse the fact. The one's the police, but we don't know how these exposures are actually impacting healthcare. So what is known? Well, the Institute of Medicine, a very important body that we all uh, listen to, uh, states quite a, 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 a very comprehensive article on the health impact assessment of new energy sources of shale gas extraction. Uh, the Senators Bob Casey and uh, Schumer got uh, quite involved in this. April 17th, an executive order from Obama supporting safe and responsible development of unconventional domestic natural gas resources. And in April 17th, new EPA regulations to conter, uh, curtail emissions by 2015 was placed. By 2011, the EPA studied potential impacts on hydro, hydraulic fracturing on the drinking water resources. Latest developments in 2011, there has been at least the identification of the water cycle, the water acquisition, destruction of water, and all these components are being investigated for violations, although we heard that the demonstration of violations are somewhat challenging. The sources of the data are really only nine companies, 25,000 wells with, wells with 12,000 chemical disclosures. The completion of the total study will be done in 2014. Other important studies that are ongoing in Pennsylvania is a Geisinger Health Outcomes Study. Geisinger, the largest managed care company and healthcare providing system in Northeast Pennsylvania, has embarked on looking at a health consequence in that area. This parallels our own work. So let me tell you a little bit about the National Institutes for Environmental Health and Science, the NIEHS, which funds our center. This is a, a, an in, institute of NIH that has designated 20 environmental health science uh, cores or centers across the country. We're fortunate to be one of these, and it convened a working group that encompassed 15 centers nationwide that had an interest in hydrofracturing. And now, what we see is the University of Iowa is here, and curiously, most of, most of uh, the sand comes from Iowa because the sand content, the fine quantity, quality of the sand is perfect for hydrofracturing in Pennsylvania. Well, the problem, and what has been recognized, is a huge increase in silicosis, a lung disease associated with sand, in Iowa as a consequence of the hydrofracturing that is now requiring this, this important concept. This working group has been very active. Uh, we'll have a white paper on the unmet needs for research that should be submitted this week and likely, if, if accepted for publication, be out in the next two months. So our project, uh, another project, was to look at 160 participants in primary care physician offices. 72 volunteers had agreed. 22% of these individuals expressed concerns about natural gas uh, uh, sort of drilling. And their major symptoms were sleep deprivation, sinus problems, and GI disturbances. This was unselected, a variety of people coming in, 
They had to agree this was qualitative research. It was just vetted at one of our national meetings. And the publication is, and, and it's, uh, the manuscript is in formulation. What was noted is the use of risk assessment framework, hazard identification, characterization, communication, and management really needs to be ferreted out. We're at the beginnings of getting the answer that you may posed earlier to me, Dr. Panettieri, will I get sick? Well, there's many places along the line that can induce healthcare consequences, but very little data. So we're hopeful that some and many of us who are doing this research will have answers. Measure air quality. What do we need? There's very few monitors in this area. We need to know what's out there. We need to use the most sophisticated air quality measurements. These are things that are available currently in every metropolitan center. Pittsburgh has a ton of them. As you go around the corner, you'll see them on the, on the roofs. What we need is to move these out into the, the areas where there's diesel trucks idling so that we get an idea of the consequences. The recommendations, the research quality for water, you've already heard the many issues that have been raised. We, in our white paper, recommendations for further research have captured the important questions that need to be, need to be asked in an unbiased answer, fashion. We just want the answer. We're not stacking the deck. In, at Columbia, they're testing the water in 40 individuals' homes in our area, and we're gonna try to match that zip code with the water quality from the residential wells. Our, resor our research recommendations are listed here. For sense of time, I wanna spare going over all of those. Our com uh, committee outreach and education group a very, very important group, reaches out to folk in the area asking what are your important questions? Why are you here today? You all have questions. We as speakers love to answer questions. Now many of the times is we don't know, but we call this community-based participatory research. We cannot answer the questions unless you allow us to sample your water, and you allow us to question. If we don't have that, we can't determine outcome. So we heard, I think, uh, previously by Dr. Oswald, he used a wonderful imagery, Pennsylvanians are rats. I'd say I want them to be consensual rats. You have to agree to allow us on sites to be able to answer some of these questions. We have to prioritize, money's limited for research. We wanna push forward in this state, and I've been a Pennsylvanian all my life, it's near and dear to my heart, all my family lives in the Scranton area, so we would love to see enough funding to get the answers that are necessary. We need to repeal the gag orders of physicians who may be able to report the consequences we need open disclosure of the uh, fraction, fracking fluid composition. We need to see conflicts of interest, certificate of confidentiality, and we need to be able to disseminate the data to you all and to the community because the communities we serve see data before we ever publish it so that they're aware of what they may read in the literature. Our outcomes will be improved care changing behavior and policy so that we know NGO is safe. Thank you. Okay, some questions from the audience. Um, is there a public health registry of health complaints uh, and problems associated with fracking? At this point, no, but there's, there's an effort afoot to get such a comprehensive database. Um, and that database should be national, not just local or regional, but it's not, I mean, there are some sites that are reporting sort of sentinel findings, but it hasn't been collected uh, in a general sense. To what extent are workers in the gas industry um, alerted to the health hazards of their job, and to what extent does the industry provide health benefits to their workers? 
That's a great question. I'm going to defer that to my colleague who's uh, from <laughs> NIOSH, uh, who will definitely speak to that point. Uh, the early uh, hydraulic fracturing that was done was done by many people moving in from other, other states. So I'm assuming they did have health care benefits. The health care benefits are very important. Not only is it paying the bills, but it's allowing us to track databases so that we know the consequences. The problem we have is if you have a lot of workers, a lot of workers that are out of state, then our acquisition of that data, if based on residence, residence we won't see that. But NIOSH is on top of this, and I'm sure we'll, we'll answer those questions. As to uh, frac waste in flowback water, uh, both solid and liquid, um, the Marcellus shale uh, waste is radioactive, and Ohio is receiving 50% of our waste. Um, what diseases and illnesses are caused by well, this again, kind of it's, it, it all depends on the dose and, and the. So, when, when one talks about toxic and effects, it's what's the dose and then the duration of exposure. So, when you think of radiation, um, let's use the nuclear bomb for example. You know, leukemias are quick. You can die of acute radiation poisoning. Any cell that turns over quickly, like your gut, will slough. You'll have massive bleeding. So that's an example of a high dose for a brief period of time. The insidious doses that, that can be for many years, and the problem here is now the displacement by 10 years of, of exposure can still be solid tumors, could be liquid tumors. It could also be endocrine disruptors. So thyroid disease. So there's a whole variety of things depending on the dose and the duration of exposure. And vulnerable populations. We heard about babies and the elderly. These are going to be patients that are going to be more affected than sort of those in, the, in, in between. 